the international pop stars and the ultimate boy band. They've gone from Disney World to around the world and shopping malls to concert halls. They've broken records in countless teenage hearts. So the question is, how did these talented young singers go from pawns in the star-making machinery to kings of the music industry? The Backstreet Boys were born to be. Boy's path to chart busting fame began in the Sunshine State in 1993. A well placed ad in an Orlando, Florida newspaper announced it was looking for local talent to audition for an all male vocal group. This was music to the ears of 14 year old AJ McLean, 12 year old Nick Carter, and 19 year old Howie DeRoe. Howie, AJ, and myself, we've been been together for the past four and a half years now. Yeah, yeah. We used to uh, sing together. The Orlando natives had formed an a cappella group after meeting one another in countless casting offices on the entertainment circuit. Orlando is big for acting, such as Universal Studios, right, and GM, right, yeah. Disney World. So we did a lot of that, yeah. like for commercials and things. We always met up, met up all the time. So mm -hmm. um, another common interest was singing. Right. So we always sang together. The boys discovered they had something going on when they began harmonizing together and began to shop around their talents as a group. We're all very talented individuals. When we come together as a group, it's just like something that's, you know. When the young Dynamos auditioned for Lou Pearlman, an Orlando business tycoon with dreams of managing the next pop supergroup, he knew he had something special on his hands and went on to search for two more members to round out the group. Kevin Richardson, then 20, was performing in the stage production of Aladdin at Disney World. A friend of his recommended him to Perlman, and he secured an audition. When Kevin began singing, it was immediately clear to everyone that he had the goods. But more importantly, he had an instant rapport with the rest of the band. The search was still on for the final member of the group. Kevin thought of his cousin, Brian Luttrell, who lived in Lexington, Kentucky. Brian's my cousin. I love him. Kevin knew his wholesome good looks and angelic voice would be sure to impress Perlman and the others. A telephone interview was set up and Luttrell was on a flight to Orlando the next day. Once Kevin brought us, you know, Brian, that's when we knew that that was going to be it. That was, that, that was Backstreet Boys. So that's where it all began. Their winning looks, all-American personalities, and undeniable talent convinced Perlman that he had a hit on his hands. I think, I mean, I think we all believe it was destiny while we're together and why we do what we do now. After hiring Johnny and Donna Wright, who had managed the careers of new kids on the block, he set out to showcase the Backstreet Boys to the world. We're not about a gimmick. We're not about being manufactured. We're about family and friends coming together, you know, in harmony and singing. In the early days of their career, Backstreet Boys played anywhere they could. SeaWorld, amusement parks, and a high school circuit through the U.S. helped the guys cut their teeth performing in front of large crowds. It was like we all grouped up and said a little prayer and was uh -huh. like, you know, be with us and let's just rock this house. And we ran out there and we were only on stage for, I would say, 15 minutes at tops. Uh -huh. But it was just, it was unbelievable. <laughs> Getting over the fear, you know, of getting up in front of people. Just making sure that you don't forget the words. I could sing in the shower all day. But. In fact, it was at a high school in Oregon that the Backstreet Boys landed their contract with Jive Records. Upon observing the enthusiastic reaction of the teenage girls in the crowd, 
Donna Wright called a Jive executive on his cell phone. The person on the other end of the call liked what they heard, and the deal was struck. With a record contract in place, the boys set about recording their first single, We've Got It Going On. The track was met with a lukewarm reception in the U.S., but it caught fire in Europe. They would tour for nearly two years straight, winning a massive fan base all over Europe and even Canada. It started in Europe, and I yeah. think it came from France and the magazines and stuff, and, and, and that's how it came to Quebec first right. before it got everywhere else. And then from Canada, it just bled over into the United States. Yeah. We've been so busy in Europe, we haven't even had a chance to promote in the United States yet, and that's what we're getting ready to do next. But the question remains, would the boys succeed in their home country, or were they destined to remain on the outskirts of American pop music? After selling out the Molson Center three nights in a row, and then coming back to the U.S. and performing in parking lots, um, it's an adjustment, but it's very humbling, and we don't mind. We're hard workers, and we don't mind. The homesick singers were ecstatic to have another opportunity to prove themselves in their homeland. This is the United States of America. We're home, this is yeah. our home. So we're we're starting all over again, which right. is which is nice. You know, some people think, oh, don't you think it's bad to, you know, be so big somewhere else and not so big somewhere else? But this is it's personal now. It's, so we're so gonna succeed. We hope. Two years of nonstop touring allowed them to polish their stage performances and develop the confidence and charisma of a bona fide super group. The Backstreet Boys were poised for pop perfection. In 1997, the Backstreet Boys re-released their self-titled debut album in the U.S. You changing it up? Yeah, we're going to do a little bit more R&B because the style of music, the mainstream in America, is a little bit more R&B as comparison to Europe and some other places where it's more popular. It quickly topped the charts and generated four other sizzling hit singles. But my love is so I have to give. It happens to be my most favorite album that we put out just because of the material on it. But I think it's just it's important for us to set ourselves straight that we're about our music. After three long years of grueling tour schedules, the Backstreet Boys' hard work was finally paying off. They had proved themselves as a force to be reckoned with. But with fame and recognition comes a whole new set of problems. The Backstreet Boys are one of the most successful male vocal groups in music history. They have set records, broken millions of teenage hearts, and silenced critics who charged that they were nothing more than a prefab boy band. And we're considered a, a, a vocal group. That's what we want to be called vocal because that's what we are. We're singers. While 1998 was the popular quintet's most successful year, it was also their most challenging. You realize that this is called the music business. Don't forget that while you're on stage doing your music, your business can be walking out the door behind you. And it's very true. It was probably our most successful year, but probably one of the most difficult years of our lives. Although the group sold over 27 million copies of their album, Backstreet Boys, the boys found they had little more money in the bank than when they started. They wondered whether Lou Pearlman, the band's founder and manager, had been distributing the profits evenly. You're not being true to me. To make matters worse, the boys discovered that Perlman had secretly been managing the group's fiercest competition, the up-and-coming NSYNC. No Overnight, Perlman went from father figure to deadbeat dad, and the young singers felt the deep sting of betrayal. There's <clears throat> constant people that are around us. In the beginning stage, we always thought that those people that were around us right from the beginning were always going to be there and there were people we could trust and count on. I think we've got to realize that the five of us, we have to trust within each other first. Ryan called in a team of lawyers to seek emancipation from Perlman and his associates. The boys were now square in the middle of a sticky court battle. 
all the while trying to maintain their heavy tour schedule. We've all grown up a lot in the last year, and we've all matured and became businessmen. We've been kind of forced to. Things went from bad to worse when a doctor broke the news to Brian that he had to undergo open-heart surgery immediately or he would be in a serious health crisis. Brian had a heart defect since he was a child, and he had twice rescheduled the operation in order to keep up with the band's breakneck pace. We're, we're just at the point where we're trying to juggle our careers and our life, so. Yeah. Because we're human beings and put our careers on a fast pace, and so we just try to keep up with it. Eight weeks to the day after Brian's surgery, he was performing with the group again. Everything went great. Uh, I want to thank the fans especially for all their support. I love you guys, and I'm happy to be back out on the stage. Not fully recovered, he relied on oxygen tanks backstage for the first few weeks. It's really hard to, to put into words right now just because this is like the first day back to work for me, but um, it's good. It's good. I feel a lot older, like I've been through a 